deficiencies in water use and climate change impacts compound this scarcity. And this is already being evident in a number of related areas. Power, for example, are manifesting themselves in shortages in India, China, and Pakistan. In the Philippines, Central Luzon is forecast to have a negative water balance by 2025. And the near absence of water, wastewater treatment means extensive water pollution and high levels of poor public health at enormous cost to life and economic well-being. Adopting technologies signaling the economic value of water and reforming water governance will be at the heart of the new efficiency paradigm. Just like green growth, efficient water will rapidly become an economy onto itself, with smaller water footprints per unit of economic output and closed loop systems where wastewater is not waste, but a resource to be recycled and reused. And it is this technology-led efficient, efficient water paradigm in Asia which is beginning to emerge, and hopefully this will be instrumental in addressing the crisis in water uh, over the next few decades. Our speaker this evening, Mr. Arjun Tapan, is the chairman of Water, water Links. It's, he himself is a leading thinker on global water issues. He wrote the Asian Development Bank's water policy that has guided its work in water since 2001. He also designed and delivered ADB's first Water Crisis and Choices Conference. He is chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Water Security from 2009 to 2011, where he leveraged the Council's effort to propagate the water energy food nexus as a key determinant of development planning. Ladies and gentlemen, join, join me in welcoming Mr. Arjun Tapu. Thank you, uh, Dean Cruz, uh, Dr. Makaranas, uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, very good evening to all of you. It's five o'clock and I'm sure that you're all wanting to run away and get on with your evening. But my job in the course of the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes uh, is to talk to you about uh, Asia's ballooning water crisis and what it means in social and economic terms and what solutions we might consider. And if you think that you are going to fall asleep, I guarantee you that you will wake up by the time I finished because uh, I myself lie awake many nights thinking of uh, what's happening around us and how uh, ignorant many of us, myself included in many ways, are of what's happening to our water world. Uh, let me, uh, I don't normally do PowerPoint uh, presentations, but I thought that uh, since most of you will probably be exposed to this subject uh, in any significant way for the first time, I thought I should use some slides because uh, they're quite powerful in what they convey about some facts in our water world. So, uh, let's take you to uh, the first slide, uh, which is this map of the world with uh, different colors showing you uh, different levels of uh, physical and economic water scarcity. And you will notice from this that Almost all of Asia, with the exception of some of Southeast Asia and Southern China, is in physical or economic water scarcity. And I don't want to burden you with numbers, but the trend in per capita freshwater availability has been one of steady decline since 1950. So the question which you might ask is, will this trend continue? I think it will. In 2011, the, in, it's the International Water Management Institute based in Sri Lanka, which I have a lot of respect and time for. It did a number of studies and its conclusion was that by 2025, all of Asia, all, no exceptions, will be in an economic water scarcity scenario. Pakistan, most of India, and more than half of China will actually face physical water scarcity. Of course, uh, <coughs> You can say that per capita availability will decline as population grows, and that is simple arithmetic. But it's also true that as industrial growth uh, occurs, the competition for water between 
cities and industry, and by industry I include energy, and agriculture will become far more intense. And if you factor in the inefficiencies of water supply, the near absence of wastewater treatment, the extensive pollution of groundwater sources, the depletion of water tables everywhere, the absence of water conservation, and the ignorance of demand management, you have a recipe for anarchy, water anarchy. What do I mean by anarchy? Essentially, and to put it very simply for all of you, it's the inability of city governments to provide a reliable 24 by 7 portable water service. So you have the unfortunate spectacle of no town or city in South Asia, which is home to almost 2 billion persons today, with 24 by 7 service, not a single one. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, not a single town or city of any size has 24 by 7 service. In August 2012, Gujarat, which is one of India's most progressive states and from where the current Prime Minister comes, had 80% of its urban population of 25.7 million people in a full-blown drinking water crisis. And India's non-revenue water rates, non-revenue water is that water which is treated but lost in the system because of either theft or because of uh, physical losses, is amongst the highest in Asia. Nobody knows how to measure it, but those who do, they say that it's well over 50%. I was just telling uh, Dr. Makaranas that here in Manila, we have two water concessionaires, Manila Water and Maini Lad. Maini Lads, non-revenue water figures are still 38%. And that is shocking because uh, water is not free. Water has an enormous cost and we'll come to that in a little while. Finally, the impacts on productivity and public health have been estimated in a country like India, which is currently at 1.2 billion people population and projected to grow uh, uh, to 1.5 billion people over the next 25 years. The losses in India are $73 billion every year, equivalent to about 6% of its GDP. Take the case of Dhaka, which is the capital city of Bangladesh. I find it very instructive. It's one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Its population is expected to be 30 million by 2025, 50 million by 2050, almost entirely dependent on groundwater. And yet, Dhaka city dumps about 1.8 million cubic meters of untreated effluent into its rivers every day. Every day. And in 2011, the Bangladesh Agricultural Development Corporation reported that Dhaka's groundwater table had declined 6 meters in 7 years. One of the fastest rates of decline in groundwater. And Dhaka is 99% supported by groundwater anywhere in the world. Let's take a look at some concrete numbers, just a few so that you understand the scale of these. One of the simplest ways of getting a handle on how much water we have is to go by the universal definitions of water stress and water scarcity. A per capita availability of 1,700 cubic meters per year is the threshold for water stress. And 1,000 cubic meters per year is the threshold for water scarcity. Even by these uh, standards, large parts of Asia, including particularly China, North, Northern and Northwestern China, and almost all of India, and certainly Northwestern India, are physically scarce in terms of water. And while you're looking at these numbers and wondering what IRWR is, IRWR is really the total internal renewable water resources, that is, internal river flows and groundwater from precipitation, i.e. rainwater. But IRWR is not all accessible. We must note that distinction because it's important to understand that accessible fresh water is what economies and societies are all about. And if you look at accessible fresh water, these numbers will actually be a lot lower. Secondly, these numbers don't tell the whole story. You wouldn't think that Australia has a problem, but Australia does have a very big problem. The issues in the Murray-Darling Basin, where 60% of Australia's food produce uh, comes from, 
it really exemplifies the conflicts between water, food, climate change, and the environment. Consider also the fact that Australia is building desalination plants for all of its principal coastal cities as insurance against current and future shortages. Take the case of Sydney. Sydney has just finished building and commissioned a $2.8 billion desalination plant. And the sad reality is that this plant has been uh, mothballed, is being mothballed for eight months out of 12 every year. And it's only supposed to operate when the water levels in the reservoir from which Sydney City draws its water fall below a certain level. And therefore, Sydney citizens are paying $250 million a year just to keep this diesel plant mothballed for that moment when the reservoir levels actually drop. So this goes on to their bills. Or take the case of uh, China. The real story in China is that over two thirds of China's 669 principal towns and cities have major water shortages. Water pollution in China is the principal cause of decline in fresh water availability. And finally, speaking about home, you would think that a tropical country like the Philippines has plenty of water, and the numbers, according to this slide, will certainly bear this out. But think again. Of the 20 major river basins in this country, 17 are forecast to experience major water shortages by 2025. Only three, Metro Manila and the two Agusan rivers in Mindanao, will be spared. Central Luzon, as Dean Cruz said a little while ago, will have a negative water balance by 2025. These are not my numbers. These are all uh, numbers which are coming from various agencies who have actually done a lot of studies and uh, modeled and forecasted. These are their numbers. So that's the background of how much water we currently have and also the context within which Asia is situated globally. Now let's talk about demand. How much water is required by whom and by when? This slide tells you a pretty scary story actually. The BRICS countries, including the three Asian countries within them, India, China, Indonesia, they dominate the world in terms of size and population and are forecast to demand more than half the world's total water needs by 2050. Three countries, more than half the world's water needs by 2050. There's no dearth of evidence of the increasing intensity of competition for water amongst the principal users. While water demand in aggregate is projected to virtually double, the share of agriculture is projected to decline relative to that of the other principal consumers, namely energy, industry, municipal. And do note that these projections are under business as usual scenarios. And by that I refer specifically to efficiency factors. These have remained at a negligible less than 1% per year over the last 20 years. So our world, the world in Asia, has remained grossly inefficient over the last two decades at a time when per capita availability of the resource has been declining, at a time when urban populations have been growing and therefore demanding more meat and dairy products. In China, for example, the meat demand has doubled in the last 20 years, forecast to double again in the next 20. Likewise dairy products in South Asia. And where does this come from? These are all water intensive products and therefore a huge squeeze on irrigated agriculture. The industrial sector in India, they claim that if current water usage in irrigated agriculture continues, water for industry and energy will decline, note these numbers, from 492 billion cubic meters a year in 2010, these are actual numbers, to 197 billion cubic meters in 2025 more than halved. So the question India asks, how does India become the next China? Very good example, and I'm going to take you outside Asia for a bit, that has been usefully researched in Sao Paulo in Brazil. I don't know if you watch, if any of you get a, a Yahoo news feed into your inbox. I get it every day, and yesterday uh, there was a news item about Sao Paulo, which is the seventh largest city in the world and which is running out of water rapidly. There is extreme water rationing in Sao Paulo as we speak. So Sao Paulo is interesting because it typifies the issues in most large Asian cities which have not been researched. 
It has 22% of Brazil's population. It accounts for 34% of the country's GDP. It also accounts for 60% of the national sugarcane-based ethanol production, 70% of total industrial water consumption. So maintaining a balance of water use in metropolitan Sao Paulo is extremely critical to economic sustainability and to social stability. In a study done three years ago, the 2030 Water Resources Group, uh, basically driven by International Finance Corporation and worked on by McKinley's, McKinsey, sorry, it estimated that it would cost Sao Paulo $285 million every year by 2030 to close the supply-demand gap based on efficiency improvements and infrastructure expansion. At the end of the day, Sao Paulo has nowhere else to go, and so an acceptable water balance will depend not merely on efficiency improvements, but on competitive water pricing policies that induce lower demand, greater technology adoption. The question to ask, and I'm sure you were wondering about this already, is where is all this water going to come from? And I'll deal with this in a bit. Let me now bring in the factor that I alluded to briefly a few minutes ago, which is urbanization. As you, most of you will be aware, Asia's urban landscape is changing rapidly. And let's start with this slide, which shows us the extent of urbanization in Asia since 1950. What's very clear is that almost a billion people moved to Asia's towns and cities in the 50 years from 1950. Almost an equivalent number would have done so in the first 20 years of this century. And of course, the high numbers come from India and China. While China already has more than two-thirds of its population living in urban centers, India has slightly less than half. But India will catch up quickly because its annual rate of urbanization is already at 2.4% per year and expected to grow. And I thought it would be useful if I were to introduce the idea of slums here. They're very big in Asia. Current estimates show that slums constitute at least 25% of the urban population for most Asian countries, with the exception of India and China, where it's about 32% each. And it's extremely difficult to provide pipe water supplies and sewer sanitation systems in slum areas. And because it is difficult, municipalities tend to leave slums alone, which is another reason why slums fester. But where services are provided, they're almost always cosmetic and the financial losses are unbearable. This next slide will help you understand Asia's position in a global context. Europe, Latin America, and North America are forecast to have more than eight-tenths of their populations living in urban centers by 2050. Asia is expected to have only 63%. But this masks the fact that Asia will be home to six-tenths of the world by 2030 and probably more by 2050. So, if the Earth were a corporation, Asia would have a controlling share. Very exciting prospect, but also a very worrying one. Let's try and understand the scale and nature of Asia's towns and cities. Take a look at this slide. In 2010, the world had 21 megacities, of which 12 are in Asia including seven of the largest 10 cities. By 2025, Asia is projected to have 21 of the planet's 37 megacities. And although megacities are often portrayed as the face of urbanization in Asia and the Pacific, the reality is that most of the region's urban population lives in secondary cities and small towns. Specifically, as of 2009, 60% of the urban population in continental Asia lived in cities with a population of less than 1 million, while only 21% lived in cities of 1 to 5 million each. This next slide expands on this theme. And look at the size of some of these megacities. Tokyo is already at 37 million and will probably be nearer 39 million in 10 years' time. Both Delhi and Mumbai are already at more than 20 million. Dhaka is at 15 million, but as I said a little while ago, forecast to go to 50 million by 2050. So mega cities are really a way of life in Asia. Look at Metro Manila. I mean, we are no different here. We are at 15 million and uh, going to get much bigger over the next 10 to 15 years. 
these mega cities are the engines of economic growth. Manila contributes more than 30% to the country's GDP. So do Bangkok and Karachi. Nothing surprising about this actually because according to PricewaterhouseCoopers who did a study on this some years ago, the world's 100 largest cities contributed 30% of the world's GDP in 2008. But their contributions are actually constrained. If you look at Delhi, Mumbai, Karachi or Dhaka, none of them has 24 by 7 water supply. Wastewater treatment systems barely exist to cover less than 15 to 20 percent of needs. And the toll taken in terms of poor public health and lost productivity is enormous. By one calculation which I came across three days ago, two million working days are lost every year in Asia alone. Can we afford that? That's the question. So this high urban population in Asia also means high densities. Take a look at this slide. It gives you an idea of densities in terms of persons per square kilometer. Most of the high density cities are in Asia. And again, those outside the developed country classification such as Seoul or Taipei suffer from serious water and sanitation issues. So rehabilitating, upgrading or installing water and wastewater infrastructure in these cities is very difficult. The high premium land, the chaotic layout of urban spaces makes this a local government nightmare. Factor in the legal proposition that slums are not recognized as legal urban dwellings and you have the beginnings of an impossible urban water management situation. I'd now like to take you to a slide that shows you the importance of basin economies i.e. economic activities concentrated in river basins and very often shared by three or more countries. Why am I showing you this? Because these basins that are listed here on this slide, they housed 30% of the world's population in 2010 and are forecast to contribute 25% of the world's GDP in 2050. And that's up from 10% in 2010. So, is this a tall order? Or is this doable? I seriously doubt whether anyone can answer this question on the basis of today's evidence. This next slide. This shows you blue water. What's blue water? That's fresh water consumed in some of these basins. The experts tell us that when you approach 60% utilization of runoffs, you threaten the ecosystem, including the survival of the river itself. Look what's happened to the Indus. Look what's happening to the Mekong, the Sir Darya, the Amu Darya in Central Asia. None of them reach the sea. Maybe for a few weeks in a year, but not otherwise. You can see from this slide that you have some serious trouble growing in the Ganges and Indus basins in India, the Hai Basin in China, and the Krishna Basin again in India. Let me now move quickly to the subject of water and food. Now, Asia's massive population, we've seen some of the numbers, uh, these need to be fed. And what's more challenging is that the composition of the food, I just referred to that a little while ago, is changing rapidly. Because of the rising incomes in the urban population of China and India, the demand for meat and dairy products is forecast to double by 2020. There are huge uh, water needs to produce the meat and dairy products. So where is this new water going to come from? The uh, pie chart on the bottom left is the global pie chart in terms of the split between irrigated and rain fed agriculture. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, Asia currently. The one on the right is Asia let me now deal with this slide. Uh, what's very interesting to note here is that farmers are already adopting atomistic irrigation with the decline of public irrigation systems. Public irrigation systems, by the way, including in the Philippines, have universally failed. They've been set up at great cost uh, to the public exchequer, but the vast majority of them have actually failed and are not delivering the benefits that they were designed to deliver. So atomistic irrigation basically is what farmers are increasingly 
going forward. And these are local, they are more efficient, and farmers have more control over the water. The downside is that most of these systems rely on groundwater, and so therefore there is a full-blown groundwater crisis all over Asia. And I'm, I'm not going to give you these numbers. You can Google it and you, know, you can have them, but it's pretty serious. And of course, then we have uh, people who claim to make policy who would tell us that you know we need biofuels because we have the problems with uh, carbon emissions and therefore uh, let's grow them. But the water footprint of uh, stuff like uh, ethanol is 40 to 70 times higher than fossil fuels. So where's where's the line that's going to be drawn? Where's the trade-off? Uh, Move to water and energy now, and the connection should be fairly obvious. Moving water and wastewater around in urban centers requires large amounts of energy. So does its treatment. Uh, stable water crops are thirsty, rice, wheat, etc., sugarcane. And getting water into fields is also an energy intensive process. But the converse is also true that producing energy requires a great deal of water. Let's take a look at this slide. There's a huge demand for energy in China. In fact, there's a very interesting uh, NGO called Circle of Blue based in the United States. And they've done a very interesting uh, study called Choke Point China, which is the, 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 the conflict between water and energy in China and how it's uh, threatening to uh, withhold the growth of China's energy sector. 75% of uh, the uh, additional capacity being created in China and India is likely to be met by fossil fuels, especially coal. And mind you, very, very little of the new coal-based power plants in both China and in India are based on uh, the latest technologies which use what is commonly called clean coal. It's not happening at the rate at which it needs to happen, and the indications are that it will not, which is why we have a problem. Thermal, water power, uh, thermal power stations are extremely water intensive. Look at the numbers here. Uh, hydropower, the evaporative loss is very, very high, 70,000 liters per megawatt hour. So while people may claim that hydropower is a clean source of energy, it is clean, but it is water intensive. Desalination is energy intensive. And what I haven't put on this slide here, that desalination has a very important negative environmental consequence, and that is brine residue. Nobody has yet figured out how to deal with brine. And brine, when dumped into the water in coastal areas, which is where most of the desal plants are, it destroys all manner of aquatic life. Uh, a word about climate change. Uh, everybody talks of it, and many, many people talk of it in very alarmist terms, and some talk of it very loosely. Uh, but this is a very busy slide where it deals with uh, the entire question of vulnerability of Asia's cities to floods and droughts. So the engines of the economy that we just spoke about a short while ago are in fact seriously at risk, not merely on account of coastal and inland flooding, but also on account of the impacts of climate change on water and sanitation. With rainfall becoming increasingly unpredictable in terms of time as well as space, and raw water sources highly dependent on the vagaries of nature, almost all of Asia's large towns and cities will have to formulate alternative approaches to new water. I said a little while ago that I'll deal with this question of where is this additional water going to come from. So let's get to it now. The one and only premise on the basis of which Asia is going to solve this crisis, to my mind, is to create new water. How are you going to create this new water? It's not going to drop from anywhere. The world has had the same volume of water for millennia. It hasn't changed. What's changed? Numbers of us and the way we use our water and the way in which our societies have developed and our economies have grown. That's changed. The amount of water in the hydro hydrologic cycle has remained exactly the same. So, to get new water, we will have to become completely efficient about the entire water cycle, not at any one point in the water cycle, but the entire water cycle. Capturing and storing water, withdrawing it and treating it, distributing it, recovering used water and recycling it. Is it difficult to get efficient? Not at all. And here are some interesting examples which should get you thinking. 
Australia's Murray Darling base, and I spoke of it a little while ago, the agricultural output of this basin is between 60-65% of the country's output. It went from 20% irrigation water use efficiency to 85% in less than 10 years. Today, in fact, Australia manages with 30% less water than it had 12 years ago, and it continues to grow at a, at a really uh, sustainable pace. Uh, take Cambodia and Southeast Asia, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority, one of my favorite stories, a development success if there ever was one. Phnom Penh Water reduced its non-revenue water, which I told you is water lost, treated water lost, from 73% to 6% in less than 10 years. It is the best water company in Asia today. You don't know too many inside stories about Singapore's Public Utilities Board. But I can tell you, as somebody who's been in this business for more than 30 years, that Phnom Water is ahead of Singapore's POB in terms of its principal function of water supply and distribution. You can drink water in Phnom Penh at any tap, any stand post, and it's equivalent to the best WHO standards anywhere in the world. You don't have to eat you don't have to boil it, you don't have to filter it, you just drink it off tap. That's that's phenomenal. In Israel, water short country, the agriculture sector uses recycled water for 85% of its total needs. 85 not a drop of Israel's wastewater is really wasted. And despite that, Israel is having to build desal plants. In fact, the majority of the world's 17,000 desal plants today, roughly 17,000. About 13,500 are based in the Middle East. I mean, that's a fact of life there. They have the energy, but they're also creating lots of problems for because the energy use is very high. And then, as I just mentioned to you, the brine problem is getting very serious. But getting efficient can be done. The point to note is that all water users have to shrink their water footprints. Sydney's uh, per capita water consumption declined from 425 liters per person per day to 292 in 10 years, but it is 150 in Singapore, 150 liters per person per day. And so Sydney has some way to go before it can be considered irrigation. Denmark is 94, all right? So people, when they know that there's no more water, they get serious about using it efficiently. What's happening in California today is also a pointer in that direction. I mean, uh, there's a $500 penalty for anybody watering their gardens in California more than once a month. So what happens? Your gardens shrivel up. They go, what do you want? Do you want your gardens to shrivel up and go, or do you want your insides to be burnt because of the lack of water? It's a question of uh, human survival. It's a question of how you want to look at your economy. And I, and I think it's not just about, when we think of efficiency, it's obviously not just efficiency in urban centers and inspecting your your uh, agencies like Manila Water and Manila to get efficient. The industrial and energy sectors have to get efficient as well. Thermal power plants are notoriously thirsty. I gave you some numbers. And so adopting dry air-based cooling systems, for example, will go a long way in reducing their dependence on water. And I know that coal-based power plants can't be wished away in Asia. But energy policy makers should also know that power stations all over Asia are already being switched off because of water shortages. I don't know if you're aware of a study done by the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, HSBC, recently. They have actually commissioned a study which concluded that 70% of all new power plants in seven countries in South and Southeast Asia, I'm not going to give you the details now, you can Google this, 70% are going to be based in already water-stressed areas. What do you expect? In Maharashtra, in southwestern India, which is actually an industrial state, very advanced industrial state in India. Super thermal power stations are being switched off for four months at a time because there's no cooling water. Okay, and the loss to the economy is that anything between three to five billion dollars a week, a week, not a month, not a year, a week. The recent uh, uptick, you may have been uh, reading about this, in industrial water users becoming efficient about water consumption is actually very good news. 
uh, large users of water such as Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle, Sam Miller, they actually have very effective programs to be water neutral in given time frames. But others have to follow suit quickly if businesses have to remain in business. About 60% of the top 500 corporates in the world today acknowledge water as a business continuity risk. And about a third of that number report the issue and its solution to their boards every year. It's now a requirement. So they're beginning to wake up. And they're waking up without the governments asking them to wake up. Because governments in most cases are still fast asleep, certainly in Asia. But the corporates are waking up because they cannot sustain their businesses without reliable, secure water services. Now I'm going to show you, uh, well, this slide was not supposed to come now. This was supposed to come last. But let's go to this slide. This is China's water availability cost curve. And this is from a, from a, a study in which I participated briefly. It's called uh, Charting Our Water Future, done by McKinsey's uh, three years ago. And uh, a very good exercise uh, in my mind, uh, showing us uh, Examples from China, India, South Africa, and Sao Paulo in, in, in Brazil showing us what can be done at roughly what cost to cover the supply demand gap in 2030. And I thought China's case is interesting. It's probably uh, not very much different to India's case. India's case is very briefly as follows that by 2030, India will have total supply of 750 billion cubic meters of water every year against an approximate demand of 1500. Okay, so there's a 50% gap. In China, you have a total demand of about 800 million billion, sorry, cubic meters per year by 2030. And you will have a forecast shortfall of about 220 billion cubic meters per year. So this uh, 25% shortfall in the case of China is likely to be made good if the Chinese policymakers were to be looking at this by most of the interventions listed in the left hand corner of this slide, the left half of this slide. Most of these interventions, and I'll read out, you probably can't see it on the slide, so I'll read this out from the text that I have in front of me. These comprise Stuff like reducing municipal water losses, uh, wastewater reuse in the power sector, uh, no-till farming in rain-fed agriculture, uh, dry de-dusting in the steel industry, commercial building leakage prevention, uh, in the power sector, condensed water cooling. So all of it technology-based uh, efficiency improvements. If China is able to take care of these, then there is a prospect of China being able to meet its projected demand in 2030 by expending about $21.7 billion every year from 2010 to 2030. Those are the costs. But efficiency, I'm, I'm showing you this slide because the real issue here is that the costs of these interventions on the, uh, the left-hand side of this slide are actually uh, way less than the value of water that is going to be created in 2030. The question you will now want to ask is, what will bring about this efficiency paradigm that I've been talking about? And I think two things are very important. The scarcity value of water is going to be increasingly reflected in its price. So water is going to get expensive, and that's perfectly normal. Water in Ireland, for example, Ireland has just been bailed out by the IMF and by the EU. And guess what? Part of the bailout package was something which is, we don't normally hear of it in Asia. We're very soft on water in Asia. But in Ireland, they said everybody will be metered. Water was unmetered. So now Ireland is being metered like there's no tomorrow. And by February, everybody who takes even a drop of water in Ireland will be metered. And what's the price of water that is being sent in Ireland? average price is now $5.58 a cubic meter. What is it in Manila? 80 cents, roughly 32 pesos a cubic meter. What's it in Shanghai? About $2 a cubic meter. Everywhere inching its way up. 
But if you were to take as a proxy the figure in Ireland, five dollars fifty eight cents, and multiply that by the nine billion dollars backtrack, nine billion cubic meters of treated water lost every year in Asia. What number do you get? 167.5 billion dollars every year in Asia. Treated water lost. Which economy, continental economy or national economy, can bear that kind of a loss? Why is nobody listening? Go figure that out. Farmers too. Agriculture draws about 85% of the total fresh water in Asia, so they can't be out of this conversation. Farmers too will have to pay more. Or they might just grow less food than they do currently. You know why? You know how much food we waste in Asia? 45% of all food grown in Asia is thrown away. Between harvest time and the time it gets to your plate, and you don't like it or you're flying in an airline and you say this sucks and you toss it away. That's part of the 45%. So, if you were to drop this number by even half, imagine the impact on water consumed by the irrigated agriculture sector. Just think about it. The second drive will be technology. And te technology is going to be used to aggressively reduce water footprints everywhere. I'll give you a story. Uh, Manila in Mutilupa, a friend of mine, he, he has a jeans factory. He makes a million pairs of jeans a year, Replay, Levi's, Wrangler, the whole lot. He sells some of them here, he exports most of it, all these jeans. Till two years ago, he was using about 15,000 liters of water for every pair of jeans. And he was losing money, madly simply because the water services were so unreliable. He'd get 15,000 liters per pair of jeans one day and he wouldn't get it the next day and he wouldn't get it the next three weeks and then he'd come back, he'd get 20,000 liters per pair of jeans and he just couldn't cope with this. He's a chemical engineer from Germany and he then decided to go back to the drawing board and see can he do with less water. After a year he came back and his production processes were all changed. He now uses less than 150 liters of water per pair of jeans. So you want to get efficient, you have to get efficient, you will get efficient. Something is going to drive you to get efficient. And in his case, the fact that his business was going to go out of business drove him to go back to the drawing boards and figure out what he could do to become efficient. Can governments make this happen? Of course they can. As in Australia, where water is a tradable commodity, its use and price is determined by the value attached to its use. Australia's water market is currently worth about $2 billion annually. I've actually seen it. I went to, a, I went to Adelaide and saw a water stock exchange where water is actually uh, traded like, like, like stocks. And what has it done to Australia? It has helped in the efficiency of water use. But the efficiency paradigm can work only if consumers don't wait for governments get into the act. There's too much to lose as evidence from what we have lost over the decades of inaction and reform. The water consuming industry really has to reform itself if it is to survive and if it is to grow. So I hope that you've now got the framework that I've been driving at and the slide that I want you to see is this one. Water scarcity and economic growth which basically brings all of what I've just said together. It shows you that Asia is in a water crisis that is driven by mutually interactive water demands from agricultural, industrial energy and the municipal sector. And these pose a set of adaptive issues and a set of risks also interrelated. Dealing with these intelligently means, if you ask me frankly, will mean a revival in Asia's fortunes. But failure, what's failure likely to get you? Failure is likely to get uh, Asia, the label, if you were writing history of Asia in 2075, also ran. That's what will happen to Asia. Don't deal with these issues today. Well, that's about it, and I'd be very happy to take questions, comments, observations, anything you want clarified. Uh, happy to do that in whatever time you have. Thank you very much.
floor is open. Please introduce yourselves and ask questions. I'm Ben Shiluko from Green Architecture for the Philippines. Uh, we are now having some uh, good and efficient, water efficient products coming into the Philippines. Uh, would you give us an insight on what's the worldwide trend on the, these water efficient products are? Yes, uh, the trend is towards becoming efficient. Maybe to take a look at toilet products, for example, flushes. You now have flushes which uh, flush at uh, 1.5 liters for a small flush for your number one job and you have 2.5, 3 liters for the number two job. You've got uh, shower heads uh, which have been completely redesigned. In fact, two years ago, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, when he was mayor of New York in early January one morning, he introduced an ordinance across the city that in the next uh, two weeks, everybody is going to change their shower heads and faucet fit fittings based on certain standards that the New York government had, uh, had uh, come up with. And so you are forced to become water efficient. Uh, likewise, uh, why stop at uh, uh, products that supply water? Why not get into products that have water as an input into their supply, including food and drinks and so on? Today, increasingly, the labels are telling you how much water was used to make a, a kilogram of coffee beans, for example. So what are companies hoping to do through this? So if you've got uh, Figaro and if you've got Starbucks, and Figaro says that, look, I only use 10 liters of water to give you this bag of coffee, and Starbucks says I use 15. If you're conscious, you'll go for Figaro if you like the coffee. If the two are okay. If you have the excess money and you are hung on Starbucks, you will go to Starbucks. But you have a choice now. And you have a choice based on how much water is used because you are concerned as a human being about how much water companies ought to be using. So that will probably impact on Starbucks and you get more efficient, shrink my water footprint. So it is beginning to happen and it's a trend which is catching on. I, I think one of the best examples in Asia today is for is perhaps in India. The Indian private sector has woken up and said that we need standards for every unit of economic output in any area of economic activity. We need to understand how much water is ideally opti uh, optimally required for that particular activity. So the Bureau of Water Efficiency uh, Standards has been set up in India in a joint venture between private sector and the government. And they are currently working on, by the end of this year, they hope to have a complete exhaustive list of standards. And those standards will then be legally enforced. So it is beginning to happen. Yes, sir. Uh, because, uh, sometime like in 80 or 81, was part of a technical working group to study water tariff setting. At other time, the revenue loss of the so called non revenue water, unaccounted for water, was about 60 plus percent. At the time, based on the NWSS. And what the regulates the world bank then was to use this atomic powered uh, vehicle mounted instrument that could penetrate to the soil and could find out where the leaks are or where the leakage traces are. But the government tore it down because there's no assurance that it will not contaminate the water supply. Next, it won't have to force that we use marginal cost pricing. And my current expect of the way is they conclude that if we use marginal cost pricing, we'll have to raise more than times four times. So okay, we'll be like that. So we went back to the usual cost of service pricing and some uh, rate, 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 uh, rate, 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 rate of return is the usual formula about uh, interest, I mean, income after uh, before taxes over uh, value assets, the uh, customers for the capital. That's what we said to me. Uh, I think that's a question about tariff setting and the uh, range of basics of what the... Uh, what's the most common uh, tariff setting uh, formula and the basic formula used in your experience? I could... Uh speak about that for hours together and uh, maybe 
most of us here would be none the wiser, but I'll just give you a few examples. Manila, I said, has an average tariff of 30 pesos, 32 pesos per cubic meter. Most of the Manila water concession area is, is not only fully connected in terms of uh, its, its concession area, which is being specifically identified in its concession agreement for the government, but Manila water quality is also very high. Manila water, uh, until about five years ago, was not bothered about reducing non-revenue water below 30% of production. And when I spoke with Tony Aquino, who was then CEO of Manila Water, he said uh, it doesn't make sense for his company to do that because the cost of saving that water is much higher than the cost of selling that water, or the price that you would get for that water. But when Tony left, and when they realized that uh, Angat, La Mesa, the usual sources for these two concessionaires weren't as reliable as they were made out to be, and that climate change uh, was beginning to become a lot more active than had been imagined. Manila water went into overdrive, and today its non revenue water is 10%. Okay. So on 10%, and on this current tariff, both concessionaires are making a killing. Uh, if you go to their websites, you'll probably see that Manila made $190 million net profit last year, 2013. So the tariff. Uh, setting in uh, the Metro Manila concessionaire uh, areas is based on a formula called uh, rate of return on investment because both the concessionaires are required not just in terms of the concession agreement but also by the Supreme Court of the Philippines in terms of the wastewater program to invest a certain amount and it's billions of dollars. It's expensive money that they're raising locally to finance capital works programs to meet the kinds of qualities of service prescribed by their concession agreements. So tariffs have to be a little higher. What's the other model that I see? Go back to Phnom Penh. Phnom Penh Water uh, raised its tariffs for the first time after 1993 when the elections were held uh, after civil war in Cambodia and uh, a democratic government was elected. There were two prime ministers in Cambodia at that time and Phnom Penh water came into its own in roughly 2001 and it increased its tariff and went to the government. 2001, today is 2014, that tariff hasn't changed. Okay? And Phnom Penh water has the best performance standards year on year in the Asia Pacific region. How do they keep the tariff flat? Anybody wants to hazard a guess? They do something which is very common in Asia. They go by volume. Okay, so their volume has expanded. And Phnom Penh used to be a city of 400,000 people in 1993 when I first went there. Today it's 1.8 million people. So by cutting down costs, by internal efficiencies, and by going to scale, he has been able to keep his tariff intact for the last 13 years and not gone back to government, ask for a tariff increase. And guess what? He's making 10 to 15 million dollars net every year. When the finance minister needs an overnight cash draft, he goes to Pnump and Water, not to anybody else, not to any of the banks. So that's the kind of, you know, you have to manage your tariffs. You have to manage your tariffs within your costs. You've got to be efficient about your tariffs. Nobody's willing to pay you for inefficient service, no matter what the tariff is. So the formulas are all very locally driven based on local culture, local expectations, how you meet local expectations. Today, all my staff are very happy. All of them who live in Laguna and Cavita and so on, they say that we are very happy with the tariff because we get great water, 24 by 7. You can drink it from the tap. There you go. Yes, please. Uh, maybe just get a party on the way I am. Uh, I have a comment for consideration. I know that water we can clean it up so that we can recycle and drink it, but there seems to be something in the health sciences that they are concerned, and that's chemical contamination. Because 
the drugs we take and goes back to the waterways cannot be removed, the chemicals are there. And these examples of this would be endocrine disruptors like hormones or even antibiotics that lead further to the antimicrobial resistance. Now, scientists haven't found a way to, to do anything about this. Just a fact of life. But right now, uh, data has shown that it can change, for instance, the sex of an animal in the river, like surgeons. But it's not to the critical point to worry humans yet, but it may come to a point in 2050. If we don't find a solution, we might be in trouble. Good comment. Uh, my reaction to that is uh, that, you know, creating new water by recycling wastewater after treatment is basically a science where you create new water for differentiated uses. Uh, and obviously, human consumption is the last use. All right? So your first order of priority is agriculture, then industrial use, then the energy sector. Uh, industrial sector including power, including uh, cement, mining, uh, manufacturing sector, steel sectors. Singapore has got something they call new water. It's actually called new water as a product, as a bottle. We've all drunk it. Uh, they got the Stockholm Water Prize in 2008 on the basis of this new water that they produce. And uh, it is finding public acceptance. So, your comment notwithstanding, there are people who are drinking new water because at the margins, and Singapore is doing something clever to get it get it taken out there, pricing it at less than the cost of the distributed water, okay? Uh, Orange County, California, and the city of Los Angeles, also in California, uh, they are pumping up to 20% of the, the, the water used from the aquifers below Los Angeles and Orange County from the effluent that has been treated is mixed then with the your normal water sources that is then pulled out in a combined way, further treated and pumped into your systems. Okay, so that's happening in the United States. It's happening in Israel. In Israel uh, effluent is again being largely diverted after treatment to the Negev Desert, which is 85% of Israel's agricultural production area. The remaining 50% goes to Haifa, Tel Aviv, and other cities for water consumption. So it's happening. So I think it's a question of, uh, of the circumstances in which you are situated where despite all the evidence that this is not completely clean, you still drink it. Because you have to drink it, there are no other sources. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Anna Rian. I work recently in one of the AIMS research projects and I'm also taking an MS in environmental science in UP Diliman. So um, I noticed that um, you all you have not really mentioned anything about rainwater harvesting because uh, well it's partly my thesis topic for one. And I think it's also something that we can push forward here in this country, considering that we get rains like oh, half the year, right? And uh, I do know that some, uh, some, and it's easy to do. And some people, uh, some industries I know, some companies are already doing it on a, you know, on, on a private basis. I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on how we can maybe push this forward because that's one way of, in a way, generating right it's, uh, new water. It's green water basically for uses and uh, like some of the developments. Um, like New Valley and Laguna, they really require their homeowners to have a double piping system to capture the green water, etc., etc. And that's what are your thoughts on it, basically? Okay, uh, a couple of things. Firstly, I did talk about water conservation. I didn't refer specifically to water harvesting, rainwater harvesting, yeah. uh, because in a global sense, rainwater harvesting is actually quite marginal mm -hmm. in terms of the needs of uh, economies including uh, urban economies. Having said that, uh, it can make a difference also at the margins. And therefore, the best way to get rainwater har uh, harvesting into the human DNA 
is to have it legislated, as is being done in a number of countries where you are being compelled by law to have rainwater harvesting systems which are being standardized in all future dwellings or office buildings, commercial buildings, and then second order priority being retrofitted in existing buildings. But again, as I said, if you ask me, I live in Makati, if you say, ask me to get uh, rainwater harvesting done today, I'll say, why? I don't have a problem. I get rainwater from Manila water. I don't need to do any rainwater harvesting. Uh, but what will happen, say, 30 years from now, when Manila Water's designed production of 300 liters per capita per day in Metro Manila, between 280 and 300, when that declines to 150, then rainwater harvesting will be a uh, requirement for me as well. Not because somebody has said that it's in the law, but because I need to go there. I, I need that water. So yes, it is important and I think that in a whole slew of efficiency measures that we wish to take going forward, rainwater harvesting must be one of them. Yes, please. I have another second question. When you mentioned about I wonder what's the experience in Saudi Arabia. Because I understand Saudi Arabia, a gallon of water is more expensive than a gallon of oil. And uh, Saudi Arabia, they said that the very successful experience of using desalinated water. <coughs> I don't know how it is heavily subsidized, probably because in Saudi Arabia they don't pay taxes, so the tariff must be lower. Uh, but then, is this is the success factor of uh, using disseminated water to supply uh, the water requirements of the human Saudi Arabia. What's the... Uh, uh, what are my thoughts on that? Yes, I think, uh, well, you know, some people uh, go to extremes to suggest that none of these Middle Eastern societies and economies are sustainable because they're all horribly artificial in terms of their uh, inability to access natural resources other than oil. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they have tried a number of experiments including towing icebergs from the Arctic and uh, I once met the president of Iceland and he said, uh, I said, why are you at this meeting on water in Davos? And he said, because, uh, because I'm uh, one of the principal economic activities of Iceland is to refurbish oil tankers as water tankers and uh, put large blocks of ice into these tankers and send them off to the Middle East. So that's still happening, but despite that, you still have a lot of desal. As I said, the vast majority, almost 80% of the world's desal plants are in the Middle East. And it is largely being propped up by desalination. Now, can desalination uh, become cheaper and can it become more environmentally acceptable? Probably yes. A lot of work I know is being done on brine residue, which is the principal downside. The other principal downside is the high uh, rates of energy consumption and therefore carbon emissions and so on. That's also being worked on. And once you get these two down to acceptable levels, desal makes very good sense for coastal societies, coastal economies. It doesn't make any sense for inland cities because you've got to pump the water inland. 150 kilometers, 300 kilometers, and that imposes huge energy costs. And we've seen a short while ago the relationship between water and energy, the two are crucially interdependent. You can't have an excess of one without creating a negative impact on the other. So you've got to be very careful there. And in fact, uh, in India, I was quite surprised, uh, uh, which I, I'm, I'm, pro I'm myself from India, of course, but I'm very critical of my own country, and I felt that. Uh, the government had no handle on this issue of water. But I got surprised the other day when I learned that there is a cabinet subcommittee on the water energy food nexus in India. They're actually working on this issue. So somebody has told them and they've begun to understand that the water energy food relationship plus climate change, of course, is so significant that it can either hold back India or allow it to go forward over the next 30 years. So are you frightened? Are you scared enough? Is it going to keep you awake? Probably not. Probably going to have a Coca-Cola after this. Yes, sir. I'm Red from ASEAN uh, Project. Having said that, having said, mentioned the whether we are afraid or not, of course we are afraid. The question is, the question I'd like to raise is that how do we really educate the people? Um, if we go down to the bottom line of the problem on this uh, water scarcity, 
us uh, in relation to economic growth in Asia, in, in, the, in the ASEAN community? How do we educate the public we, um, with the um, popularity of, of uh, green technology, green building, and all that, recycling, water, and all that? But how do we get to the water from the issue? And, or how do we get to the water of the consciousness of the mass public? Thanks. That's a good question. I think uh, there's a few ways of handling this. One is the political leadership. The political leadership is to get away from this mythology that water has to be supplied either free or at very low cost to everybody. Those days are over. And that mythology has outlived its usefulness. It was useful at one point of time to get votes in countries like China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. It doesn't appeal to anybody anymore. I was telling Dr. Uh, Dr. Magranas that uh, just last week we had elections in the state of Maharashtra and India, 122 million people, the most advanced industrial state in the country. The party from which the current prime minister comes, that party for the first time in India's independent history, it's now about 70 years, it won the elections. On what issue? Water. Okay. So Maharashtra is beginning to wake up because the examples I quoted to you about power stations being switched off for four months, all the water being diverted to these uh, fat cats in the sugar sector because all the sugar cane barons in Maharashtra were taking all the water away from the public irrigation scheme. The guys who were going, growing cotton and uh, oil seeds and so on, they got very little. All of this came to a head in the last elections one week ago. Okay, so there is awareness. Uh, when somebody feels the pinch, he becomes aware. But the political leadership has, an, has, has, a, has a duty to, to educate its, uh, its electorate in terms of the issues that it is going to face. I mean, why are people talking in, 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 in Indonesia? You mentioned ASEAN. In Indonesia, fuel subsidies uh, take up almost a quarter of the national budget. In India, it was the same number. But last week again, the Prime Minister said that because oil prices have now declined from $115 a barrel down to I think about $80 or $85 a barrel yesterday, he took the decision that this is as good a time as any to get rid of fuel subsidies. So diesel has been completely free now in India. That's the most, uh, the most uh, heavily used petroleum product in the country. So the, the political leadership has to be seized of the issue and it has to provide leadership at its, at its own level. You go to the other extreme, which is the local communities. Local communities, city of Bangalore again in South India, they've got a scorecard now for the water companies that are serving Bangalore. How well are you doing in giving us clean water 24 by 7? When you're doing badly, we will not be paying you, we will not allow you to operate. So there is, what, what has developed in some cities in Asia is this very aggressive, community-based approach to the demand for high-quality water services. I'll give you another example where this message can come from. From the industrial sector, three years ago, I had a group of industrialists, again, from Maharashtra, who said that the Bombay municipality doesn't give us enough water. Our industrial activities are being affected. Workers are being laid off because factories are being closed for three to four months on end because of insufficient water. So I said, what do you want from us? He says, I'd like you to go to Delhi and talk to the government in Delhi and say that we, the industrial association in Maharashtra, have come together to buy all the wastewater that Bombay generates. We will buy, we will develop the facilities for the wastewater in Mumbai and Greater Mumbai. Treat that and sell it to ourselves at a price to be regulated by the government. He says, where is the risk in that? Why? So, industries are beginning to become conscious. And I think through industrial activity, workers in industrial units are beginning to become active because their future, their livelihoods depend on it. You don't want to be laid off because your, your, bar, your, your cement plant doesn't have enough water or your Coca-Cola factory doesn't have enough water to bottle. But, I think the message can also be given by, by, by other means. You take, for example, uh, non-revenue non water. 
in the Philippines, you have a you know, bizarre situation where all the water given to the two concessionaires is free. It doesn't cost them anything. Raw water to Manila water in Manila is given at no cost. And Secretary Singh Son recognizes that today, that that's a flaw in the concession agreement, but you can't amend that agreement halfway without getting involved in the courts. So what do you do? That's a mistake. But today, if you were to, if you were to renegotiate, ideally speaking, the concession agreements for Metro Manila, you would never give the wrong signals by not pricing the raw water. And because you're not pricing the raw water, the transmission mains from Angad are leaking like a sieve. Nobody's fixing that. You have to become conscious about the fact that water today, given our numbers in Asia, given the economic activity, and given our economic ambitions, is no longer a finite resource. It is scarce. And scarcity must have an economic value. Okay. Other questions? Yes? Of course. As many as you wish. Because you mentioned about if you think, think in my mind that will there a possibility to have a war because of Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, tensions are running very high. I mean, if you look at Africa, the Nile Basin, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, they are daggers drawn. Uh, over what? Over very little water that actually goes down the Nile today. Because there's been so much waste, there's been so much overuse, that tensions are very high. And politically, uh, it's very easy to divert attention from water by accusing the other country of having overdrawn its own resources. Like same is happening between India and Pakistan. Pakistan is accusing India of breaching the this water treaty agreement and saying that which was 1960 done by the World Bank at that time lasted all these years. Now they're having difficulties because Pakistan, as I just indicated a short while ago, is almost out of water. Pakistan's agricultural uh, growth per year has declined from 5.8 percent 15 years ago to 2.2 percent last year, all because of water. So I mean, you will obviously create tensions. India and China. China is now planning to dam the Brahmaputra River in eastern India. All of eastern India lives off the Brahmaputra River. Now you build dams upstream, you create problems downstream. It's happening in the Mekong. Uh, the Mekong today in southern Vietnam, which is the delta area of Vietnam, the Mekong doesn't flush. So what's happening? Salt water gets in from the sea, and guess where the salt water has got in? A hundred kilometers inland. 100 kilometers. I was in Ho Chi Minh City two years ago and I met the general manager of uh, Saigon Water Company and I told him, you know, your non-revenue figures are so high, this is a disgrace, 45%. And he says, sir, I don't care about them, nobody wants to drink my water, it's all salt. That's my bigger problem. How do I clean up my salt? And where do I store the residue? That's an environmental issue. So, the guy is caught between a rock and a hard place. I mean, these, these kinds of issues, are increasingly taking center stage. And so therefore, the stoking of political tensions by water issues is very much there. I mean, if you give me your email address, I'll put you in touch with a think tank in Bombay. You can actually go to their website. And uh, it's about the water from the Himalayas for South Asia and for, for China, including Tibet, Xinjiang, and all that region. And what the prospects are for actual armed conflict on the basis of the current water wars. Have you mentioned the side case between Pakistan and India and the side case of the Philippines between, you know, with this story between Manila and Manila water? Looking at the big picture, how are we seeing China? Um, take advantage of these uh, poor situations. Say, for example, what if given the opportunity, they think of water terrorism. Water terrorism? I think that's kind of exaggerated. <laughs> I won't go that far. I think... Uh, How about China? China's about case is, is actually, I mean, China's huge, China's complex. But China's biggest problem 
biggest problem, I mean, you can do, I've done a lot of research on China. China's biggest problem is water pollution. They have expanded so fast in industrial terms. They've become the workshop of the world, but that's a huge cost. None, but, but none of the water bodies in northern China, including the high river basin, which I referred to in my talk, can be touched. You can't put your finger in that water without it not getting burnt. So it's, uh, it's unfit not just for human consumption, it's unfit also for agriculture. The Chinese just refuse to touch it. It's going to take years to clean that up. So the costs that I gave you on that slide a short while ago, those costs are actually the best case scenario. $20 billion a year is nothing for China. China will have to spend a lot more, a trillion dollars is one estimate by the United States EPA to clean up China's uh, water bodies. So China has issues in that respect. China also has issues in terms of the su southern part of China having more water than any part of the north, hence the south to north diversion project. And what is that going to do to China? It's going to bring in less than 30 billion cubic meters of water every year from the south to the north. But if you're not going to be efficient about using that water, you're back to square one. And guess what? Last year, China imported 148 billion cubic meters of water. More than 25% of what China currently uses, it imported. And when I'm talking import, I don't mean they imported actual water. They imported virtual water through food products and through other products that are water intensive in terms of manufacturing. So that is China's water footprint. So China needs to get smart, and China knows it needs to get smart. And therefore, the current issue about the water energy conflict in China, I mean, China is building three power stations a week. There's no way in, those, in which those power stations can be sustained without getting water efficient. So water efficiency is an internal issue first. The stealing of water from the Mekong, some countries call it stealing, I don't, because I think, frankly, on the Mekong, China has done a great service to downstream users, including Burma, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The Mekong Water Commission uh, has done studies which demonstrate that China's building dams on the upper reaches of the Mekong has, in fact, uh, helped abate the wet season flow. So there's no excessive flooding as would have happened ordinarily if those dams had not been built to act as reservoirs in the wet season. And in the dry season, when China uses those dams and the water for hydropower, the water is then allowed to run through the river and increase the dry season flow. So China is actually doing a very good balancing act in terms of the Mekong. Whether it has the same plans for the Brahmaputra, we don't know. The Indians don't seem to think so. So it's very natural when you are short of water to become suspicious of your neighbors and expect the worst. Will that happen? I can't say. I don't think you'll have anyone who can give you a straight answer on that. But this, this, uh, this think tank I referred to, it's called Himalayan something forecasting. They do a very good job of trying to do as fine an analysis as possible. Well, it's 6.30, and that's, that's the time that we have. Um, this uh, topic, I think, is it's going to be something that's going to consume us in, in the development management field. In fact, um, one of our students here is doing a MRMR on uh, what's happening in the middle of water in Manila. Um, but I think, uh, some of you guys in the MBA field, this is uh, potentially very rich MRR uh, topics for you. So, uh, Arjun, thank you very much. Join me in, in thanking Mr. Taubman for the presentation and uh, with the group uh, token of our oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming.